So welcome all to the Lougheed College Lectures. I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you. My name is Lois Harder, and I am the new principal of the PLLC. So uh, this is my, my first opportunity to stand in front of you at an LCL, Lougheed College Lecture, and, uh, and it is a great honor to do so. <laughs> Um, so as we begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of uh, the First Nations and Métis people. Now, a little bit about the college. So it is, it is a very new endeavor established in 2015, and it aims to equip U Alberta, University of Alberta students with the knowledge, skills, and experiences that will enable them to lead in interdisciplinary contexts and prepare them to engage with diverse peoples and ideas, educating them to be outstanding leaders for our future. So we are very fortunate today to have Jeff Wachtel visiting us from Stanford University, and Jeff is in charge of a graduate program for uh, leadership students at Stanford, and uh, we were speaking earlier today about how much we're investing in the leaders of the future because of how badly many of us in my generation have screwed it up. So there's a lot on, on your shoulders. Um, all right, so our, our um, so we have an undergraduate program, and our classes are also supported by wonderful graduate student teaching fellows who. Um, get fantastic teaching training and also professional development as, as they work with our undergraduate students. So as part of our undergraduate certificate program, students take a course called Topics in Leadership, and this lecture series is an important part of that course, which is taught by my wonderful colleague, Dr. Rhonda Broekreutz, who hails from the Department of Ecology in the Faculty of Human Ecology, rather, in the Faculty of Agriculture, Life and Environmental Sciences. And you'll get a chance to meet Rhonda a bit later because she'll be moderating our post-lecture conversation. So the purpose of this lecture series is to expose students and community members to provocative research and great big ideas that will challenge our thinking and inspire positive action. And we are extremely grateful to St. Crew Canada for the generous donation that makes this series possible. And we're very fortunate this evening to have, have a representative from Syncrude here, Dr. Malachy Car or Mr. Malachy Carroll, who is the General Manager of Research and Development, and he has kindly offered to, uh, to say a few words, so I'll cede the floor to him for the moment. Great, thank you very much, um, and good evening. It's my pleasure to join you this evening and bring greetings on behalf of Syncrude. Um, my name is Mal Carroll. I am Syncrude's manager of research and development. And um, hello, Campion. I'm not sure she's in here. Um, and and, <laughs> and Liam. So so full disclosure, my son Liam is in the Peter Lougheed Leadership College. <laughs> He's in philosophy, and I'm an engineer, which certainly uh, stimulates some critical thinking and makes for some interesting discussion around the dinner table on Sundays. So at Syncrude, we know that education and critical thinking are keys to unlocking the potential in our industry and addressing the challenges um, that come along with it. For us, every facet of our business requires collaboration across multiple disciplines to achieve success. We are committed to three priority behaviors in our organization to enhance our company. We will lead, we will learn, and we will collaborate. In fact, our mission statement calls for us to encourage learning and innovation in everything we do. Not that far off the listen, lead, learn theme of these lectures. It's those behaviors in our organization that have led to over 200 patents from our research and development department. It was Syncrude that invented the technology hydrotransport, which allowed the oil sands to develop while dramatically reducing GHG emissions from the bitumen extraction process. It was Syncrude that achieved the first certified rec reclaimed land in the oil sands industry. Our company is also responsible for the majority of land reclamation in the oil sands, 3,700 hectares, and we're continuing and committing to double that by the year 2030. And it was Syncrude that earlier this year partnered with the governments of Canada and Alberta, the Natural uh, Conservancy, and the Tall Cree First Nations to create the Birch River Provincial Park. 
it and several other new parks in northeastern Alberta created at the same time um, now form the largest protected area of boreal forest in the world, a whopping 67,000 kilometers. This is uh, one-tenth of our province, um, or uh, twice the size of Vancouver Island, just to put it into perspective. These outcomes require leadership, vision, critical thinking, respect for our environment, and diverse perspectives, um, perseverance and grit, and much more. All things this program and this lecture series will delve into in detail this coming academic year. That alignment between our company values and this program has attracted us to the Peter Lougheed Leadership College, and this is why we have committed $500,000 to sponsor these lectures for the next five years. So on behalf of Syncrude, So on behalf of Sinku, thank you for attending and enjoy the evening. Thank you very much, Mel. We really appreciate that. So before I formally introduce our speaker this evening, we just have a few announcements. First of all, we want to thank everyone who brought a donation to the Campus Food Bank this evening. Um, if you plan, if you did not do that, but you plan on attending future events, we, we encourage you to do that the next time around or to donate online. During the address tonight, we ask that you do not take any audio or video recordings. We are recording um, the event and it will be available to the public on our, on our website. And tonight's lecture will run until about 6.45. So beginning with our lecture, and then we'll have a Q&A. And when that's complete, we'll say goodnight to all of you, and Sarah Hastings Simon and the Lougheed Scholars will leave the lecture hall to reconvene in their uh, forum classrooms for the second half of the class. Just to alert you, our next uh, lecture is on decision making. It will be held on Monday, October 29th, and Ken Regan, who's the former CEO of CKU Ra CKUA Radio, um, will be our speaker that evening. So if anybody knows the history of CKUA and how it came to, to be in its current state, um, I'm sure that will be very fascinating. So I would now like to introduce you to Dr. Sarah Hastings-Simon. Dr. Simon is the Managing Director of the Alberta Clean Economy Program with the Pembina Institute. She holds a PhD in Physics from the University of Geneva, and her expertise lies in clean tech, electricity grids and markets, and emissions reduction policy. Her work has included development of a detailed model of the North American power sector, research on success factors in the clean tech industry, and development of international and what would be the next word? Domestic <laughs> policy for climate change and emissions reduction. She has worked with provincial and national governments, utilities, renewable energy developers, financial institutions, and oil and gas companies. Her talk this evening focuses on critical thinking and is entitled Interdisciplinary Approaches to the Complex Energy and Climate Problem. In the wake of last week's release of the report for the UN Intergovernment Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, I have no doubt that this will be a very timely and lively conversation. Welcome, Dr. Simon. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, and I guess I should thank the IPCC and the Nobel Committee for having come out with such topical news and, and awards uh, leading up to my talk. It's very, very fitting. Um, so thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, it's unusual for me these days to give talks sort of as broad as, as critical thinking. I spent a lot of time talking about the details of uh, electricity market design. Um, and I thought better of, of spending 40 minutes talking about capacity market design. So I promise not to, to bore you with those details. Um, instead, I wanted to explore a little bit around what critical thinking looks like. So if I can make some slides come up here. Um, so as I was Thinking about this talk, um, I was reminded of a, a story, maybe many of you have had similar experiences to this. Um, this actually goes back to when I was a university student uh, taking a, a math class and we had a take-home exam. Um, and so we had you know, a day or something to finish this exam and had 
long, relatively complicated questions um, that were meant to test, you know, whether we had really learned and, and understood what was going on. And there was one question that was quite tricky, uh, particularly, and I had been working on it for a while and, and didn't really get very far and decided to put it away and, and do something else. Um, and I think I had gone to get ready for, for bed to go to sleep, and I was in the bathroom brushing my teeth, and all of a sudden the answer just sort of popped into my head. Not the, not the process of getting there, but, but the answer in this sort of fully formed way. Um, and I think that's a really interesting lesson for us around the way that thinking happens, right? We have, you know, this, these two pictures that I have here, I think sometimes we think about this first way of thinking that, you know, we start with a question and yes, we may sort of veer around as we, as we get to the answer. But actually, there's a lot of our thinking that takes place in a way that we don't even see. It's in this black box. We have this subconscious that's taking information in uh, and, and things are happening in there that, that we don't always see and um, we can't really frankly always understand what's going on aside from knowing the inputs and, and then the outputs. And that's um, you know, useful in some ways, right? It's great when it helps you to come up with the answers to problems. It's, it's nice if you can feed your subconscious a question and have it work on it while you're you know, busy doing other things. Um, but it's also challenging in a way because it means that a lot of the really sort of interesting critical thinking that we're doing um, is not even something that we may be able to, to completely understand. But we can understand you know, what are the pieces that we're putting in there, uh, and how do we think about what's coming out? And I think that can help us to understand a little bit more around what's going on in that black box. So I thought I'd start just with a little bit of an overview of where I come from, uh, because I think my, my own experiences really influence what I think about uh, interdisciplinarity and, and how that is an important part of solving some of these questions and challenges. Uh, and so I have, I have a couple pictures from the various different things that I've, I've done since, um, since I started working. So I started off um, really with a, with a deep interest in, in energy and in science. Uh, and I decided to do a PhD in physics. And um, I was sort of torn between this energy question and, and quantum physics and these deep mysteries that, that come out of there. And in the end, that won out. And I sort of wandered actually away from this path that I ultimately ended up on and spent a while um, in a lab uh, studying rare earth ion doped spectroscopy. Um, relatively little to do with energy, but, but the story comes back around. Um, and I was there, I think as this picture aptly shows, uh, a PhD in physics is about 20% thinking and about 80% finding the right cable to connect one thing to another thing. <laughs> sort of the, the main thing that you have to do uh, to, to get a PhD in physics. Um, but I came to the end of that period, and I was tired of finding the one cable to connect the one thing to the other thing. And I wanted to do something else. I wanted to do something, research science can be very slow, um, and it can be very narrow, um, which can be really interesting, but it can be frustrating sometimes too. And so I'd heard um, that this place, McKinsey, hired people with a PhD in physics, and to be honest, I didn't really know what management consulting was, other than it wasn't working in a lab. Uh, and so I decided to go off and, and, and do that. Um, and I mention that because I think sometimes when we look back on the experiences that people have or these paths that they've been on, you know, we think, oh, you know, we, you went into this with this grand plan and like first you're gonna learn about science and then business and you know, all these things would tie together and you can tell this really elegant story about it in the end. Um, but the truth is often a lot more messy than that, right? You can you know, kind of have this sort of random walk that takes you from one place to the next um, and as long as it's sort of connected by some, uh, some common thread or you know, common interest, there's a lot that you can do with those, those kind of different paths that you're on. And so I got to, to McKinsey um, and I knew kind of nothing about anything outside of the lab. And I remember being really sat down basically by, by my first boss and, and told things like, uh, by, told things by them like, um, you know, there's different ways that people can be convinced or influenced about things. They can be influenced or convinced by showing them the data and you know, providing the logical argument that you know, if you believe A, B, C, and D, then this must be true in the end. And you know, that, that sort of made sense. I was OK with that. Um, but then they continued. <laughs> and they said, you know, and then there's these other ways, there's eight other ways that people can be, uh, can be influenced or can be convinced of something by you know, what, their, what their peer group understands, what they're convinced of, um, by uh, other values that they hold. And that, I remember, was just mind-blowing. I 
sort of, it was so far out of the frame of reference that I had from, from the experience that I had in the lab that I didn't even know, you know, the idea that this was even possible was sort of um, completely in incomprehensible. Um, and that was the, the, I think, the first moment that I started to realize that, you know, hey, different, different people in these different uh, disciplines, you know, it's not just that they're working on different topics or they have different expertise, they actually may think uh, in a very different way. And so I spent um, a number of years um, in, that, in that space working with um, different businesses on some of the, the big challenges that they were facing. And then when, uh, when the government of Alberta decided to move forward uh, with climate policy, I saw an opportunity to sort of turn my focus back to, back to home and hopefully bring some of the things that I had learned from my time uh, as, a, as a consultant into the world of policy development in Alberta. And I did this over um, a range of different countries. So I, I started off in the US, and I was in France and Switzerland for, for my studies for a while, and then eventually here in Canada. Um, and as I said, you know, it it's, was sort of much more of a random walk than any planned uh, you know, picture that I had to get from, from point A to point B. But I did always have this common thread, right? This interest in, in energy, um, in, in the... Uh, in all forms. So everything from, you know, the, the sort of basic science of where does, where does this energy come from? What are the machines? What is the, what is the basic physics that underlies some of these energy processes? To how does it work when you start thinking about building a business around these things? And then ultimately, what is the policies that, that help to make these things happen? And more specifically than just, uh, just energy, it was really this question of the decarbonization challenge. Um, and this is, you know, something one could give a whole talk or even a whole class on. Um, so I, I'm just going to share these two graphs here because I think they really encompass well the, the challenge that we're, we're facing here. And so on the left-hand side, you have this animation that's running, and I think we'll start again. But it's basically showing the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere starting um, in about the mid-century and running through 2017. And you see these rings. They're moving outwards, um, and the you know bigger rings is a is a bigger number, a higher concentration, and so the the what it's basically showing is that the the atmospheric concentration of CO2 has been rising steadily year on year. And then the other graph, which is this pretty colors of of blue turning into red, is showing the actual global temperature variation um, going back a little bit further, uh, running from um, what is this, from, from left to right. And the, the scale of temperature there is 1.5 degrees. Um, and you may have seen different variations of this graph, but I think that this one really uh, does a good job of, of showing what becomes quite clear that the temperature is increasing. And so as the IPCC report just showed, and as, as the evidence is increasingly mounting, you know, these two graphs are not just um, correlated, but there's a causal link, right? The, the rising concentration of CO2 is causing the temperature to rise. And this is something that, that we need to do something about. And the reason that, you know, I, I kind of follow this energy path when I have an interest in, in decarbonization is that energy is a big part of the, this question. So how can we be successful? How can we successfully decarbonize um, and address those rings, get them to start folding back, uh, back inward? So the, the recipe that I have is, is relatively simple. It's two parts. It's focused on energy because energy is by far the largest source of carbon emissions uh, in our world that we can control. And so it's really just two things that we need to do. So we need to use energy resources more efficiently um, and we need to start to use more lower carbon forms of energy. So energy is, is very useful, right? It, it does all kinds of great things for us, so we obviously don't want to, don't want to give it up. Um, but if we can accomplish the same things with less energy use, and you know, a classic example of that is an LED light bulb. So a light bulb that um, takes energy, um, takes electricity, and with a lot less electricity can make exactly the same amount of light that an incandescent bulb can. And so, you know, you get the same thing in the end, this light, um, but you don't, uh, you don't use as much energy. And then the second one is, is to use lower carbon forms of energy. So, you know, that's saying, well, if we want to generate electricity, you'll come to see that electricity is a common theme. It's one of my favorite subjects. Uh, that uh, one of the, the ways to do that instead of using coal is to use gas or renewables or other forms of electricity. 
So in a way, it sounds really simple, right? I mean, there it is. There's the answer. Do these two things. We're done. We can all go home and you know, be happy that we, we solved this challenge. But of course, really, I've, I've cheated a little bit here in that I haven't really answered the question. I've just restated the problem. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about why this is challenging and where, um, you know, where I think critical thinking actually overlays with why these, these two uh, steps are so difficult for us to accomplish. And the reason that it's so complex is because this exists when this, within this broad system with all these different stakeholders. The different stakeholders have different, uh, you know, different desires. They're trying to get different things out of the system. But also, importantly, they speak different languages. They think very differently. They have different things that go into their black box so, uh, and, and different things that are going on in their black box. So they may start with the same problem with the same set of information and come up with a different answer. And so I think part of the, the key to successfully decarbonizing, to solving this, this problem, is really to understand how can we get people to understand what's going on in each other's black boxes? How can we increase the communication that we have and, and really understand how others are thinking? So to make this a little bit more real, um, I will give an example from the electricity system. So I know this is a little probably hard to see, but um, what it, what's here is, is sort of two pictures of the electricity system. And the, the one on the top is the system that we have today. And it's the system, interestingly, that has existed more or less since we started um, using electricity in the first place. And so what that looks like is these large um, decentralized electricity plants. A lot of them are coal plants. Uh, they were historically, and, and in Alberta, they, they still are to some degree. Um, they make a lot of uh, air pollution, so we typically put them far away from, uh, from city centers because it's not very nice to live right next to them. And then we use these large wires to bring the electricity that they produce um, into the cities, and then we put them into a grid of smaller wires, and we send that electricity out uh, into all the, all the different places that are using electricity. And so this is a very uh, centralized system. You have these very big, big units of generation because it's more efficient to make them bigger. Right? You, you, um, more efficient from a cost perspective, more efficient from a, uh, an energy use perspective. Um, and, uh, and, and they are feeding a demand, they're feeding people electricity where there's, you know, anybody can basically just choose at any moment to turn a light on or to ask for electricity in some way. The system is very much responding to the demand that's coming. And so that's the electricity system that, that we have today. And now we can paint with the technologies that we have already um, a, a future electricity system that's actually very much uh, more low carbon, right? That, and that's sort of the, the picture on the, on the bottom in the blue. And you'll notice it has a lot more things in it, um, a lot more smaller lines. And so the interesting thing about that system is that all of the technologies that are shown in there, uh, for the most part, are, are existing today, and, and many of them are, are quite affordable, right? Um, but one of the things that you may notice is that it's not simply replacing one of the, the generators with you know, a bunch of other things in its place. It's actually starting to think about that system in a totally different way. And so you have smaller generators, you have things like wind and solar, they may be located all over the place. You, you don't have quite the same questions of economy of scale or efficiency of having these really big plants, so you may have smaller amounts that are more spread out. Um, they're, not, uh, they're not giving up as much direct pollution, so they can be closer to where we are. But um, you know, obviously, one of, the, one of the challenges and things that people talk about as being a, a hard to do to integrate a lot of renewables into a system is their variability, right? They are dependent on when, um, you know, when the sun is shining and when the wind is blowing. Um, and so one of the ways that uh, you know, often people think about to, to manage that is storage, right? So saying, okay, well, if we could just store the electricity for when we want it, then, um, then we'll, we'll have solved that problem. But that's very much a solution that's sort of in the framework of this old system. Right? And you can come up with, a, with another solution that says, well, what if we had more flexibility in the demand? You know, what if there were all kinds of things that we used electricity for um, that we might want to have at a certain time, but it actually makes no difference if we have them a bit later? Right? So if I think about my freezer, for example, right now it turns on you know, more or less at random um, to cool down when it you know, hits some, some set point that says it's gotten too warm. But 
you know, if it turned on five minutes earlier or five minutes later or, you know, even an hour earlier and cooled down a bit more and then wasn't on an hour later, it would still keep my frozen pizzas just as cold, right? And so that starts to give a, a bit of an understanding of this is not this transformation and the reason that people use these big words like transformation and evolution and um, is exactly because this is not about just sort of replacing one for one. It's actually about this really fundamentally different way of, of thinking about things. But it turns out that that's, you know, I can paint this nice picture and say, well, you know, if I was the one in control of everything, I could just poof, change it all, and it would look like this, and it would work like this, and then we would be done, and, and we could all, you know, go home and be happy. Um, but, of course, things are not as simple as that. Right? And, and there's all kinds of barriers within the system in the form of you know, sunk capital, things that are existing already, the incumbency, the market structures. Right? When we created the market for electricity, we didn't imagine that you know, it might work this way in the future. We didn't imagine that there would be a way for somebody to control your refrigerator from far away you know, with this thing called the internet. Right? And so the idea that you could have flexible demand at the time it would have taken you know, somebody running around the neighborhood telling people to turn off their refrigerators, right? It's obviously an absurd idea. And so it was so far out of the realm of, of what people could have imagined that the system simply weren't designed for it. And so there's all these kinds of natural barriers that are in place, but then there's a whole other layer of barriers that come about because of the communication uh, and all the different actors that are in this system. And so not only do we need to understand, okay, within this ideal system, how, how could we go through this transformation, but how do we actually get people all agreeing on what the problem is and, and working together to, to figure out the solution? And that's where I think, again, that, that question of how do you understand you know, the engineer and the business person and the policymaker, the one who's saying, I'm going to design the market or I'm going to uh, design the system, how do you get them speaking the same language? And so one of the things that, um, that helps is to understand, to start to pull back the layers and understand what is it that, that makes new technologies be successful. And I think this is an interesting example because you start to get an understanding of how these different groups are thinking very differently. Right? And so if I'm a scientist, I'm really interested probably in that technology quadrant, right? I'm, uh, or an engineer. I'm really interested in what is it that I need to you know, do to my widget? What is the thing that I need to, de to develop to make it work? Um, and maybe I think a little bit about the regulation, but I'm probably not thinking very much about this access to market, this like, question of you know, how am I going to have customers that are, that are coming? Um, and if I'm uh, you know, someone who's, who's relatively far removed from the technology, I may lack this understanding of how fast some of the technologies can progress. And not, and, and not being able to understand that can, can make you plan for a future that may look very different than it is. So just to, to kind of get a little bit more into what those looks like, and I, I'm going to make some, some pretty... Um, outrageous stereotypes, so I will do it with a caveat that I'm only talking about myself in this, in that I have been a scientist, I've been a business person, and I've been working in policy. So there's obviously you know, people that, that are wearing these different hats that are you know, not thinking in this way. Um, but if I reflect on the ways that I've thought when I sat in these different roles, um, you know, these, are, these are some of the things that I noticed. So as a scientist, I think I mentioned, um, you know, I, I thought a lot about these really detailed question about um, you know what what kind of uh, interactions inside this one specific material that I studied what that looked like what what drove it what were the electrons doing when they were in there and the way that I communicated that to other scientists was from a very bottoms up uh, perspective right so I could come in and make a statement uh, and say you know hey I found out this thing this you know this problem that I've solved, this is true. And, and my scientist colleagues would say, okay, well, that's, you know, that's all well and good, but like, show us the data. And, and take us through, step by step, all of the things that you've shown um, to understand that you know, that's really true, what you're, what you're telling me. And you know, anything else that you have to say, I'm not really interested in it. Like, I, I just want to see the data. And when I moved into this other world and, and became a management consultant, you know, that, that changed again. Um, and the other thing that I was, you know, sat down and told was, you got to tell people the answer first. 
right? Like, it's nice that you did all these calculations and you figured out that, you know, this is the reason that this is going to happen and that and that and that, but, you know, people are busy. They don't have a lot of time. They, you know, they want to know, business leaders want to know that the decisions that they're making are, are based on facts and evidence, but they don't necessarily need to see it all, right? If they trust you, they'll trust you that, that you did that work. They want to see, you know, the conclusion so they can understand what to do with it. And then as I stepped from the business space into the policy space, there was yet another set of rules to learn. And there you had you know, people that are balancing the needs of many, many different stakeholders. All of these different you know, people that elected officials are, um, are, are representing and are looking out for, many of whom with you know, different objectives and different ideas. Um, they're very beholden to these external timelines, right? You have election cycles, you have certain times in a, in a mandate when things can be done and certain times when, when things can't be done, even if, you know, outside of that, it would make perfect sense to do a certain thing now. And moreover, you have people that, um, you know, are responsible for very broad portfolios of, of things. They, they have many files. They can't be necessarily super, super deep into the details on all of them. And so seeing that, that people are approaching these different disciplines in very different ways. So it's not just that they're thinking about different topics, but they actually are thinking in different ways um, was, was a really interesting um, process to go through and to, to kind of see in, in reflecting backwards. And to me, that, that brought up this idea of the need for translators. And I like the word translator because I think the metaphor of the idea of you know, translating between people who are speaking a different language um, has a lot of interesting components to it. Right? So you're talking about you know, scientists, engineers, business makers, policy. They may literally speak a different language. Right? They may have vocabularies that are not overlapping. Or they may have words that they're using that are the same, but actually mean very different things. And so a translator, a very good translator, is not someone who just you know, does Google Translate and kind of takes the words in and spits back out the dictionary definition of the words in the other language, but there's someone that really understands what the meaning and the nuance is behind what those words mean. And so just like it would be hard to have a conversation where you solve very difficult questions or you, know, you have a very meaningful discussion with somebody via Google Translate, you know, you, get, you probably get the gist. You may think that you're having a conversation, right? You may think that you understand, but a lot of what you're doing is projecting, you know, your understanding of, of what's being said onto what the person is saying. And sometimes you're probably right. You know, I mean, scientists and policymakers and business people can talk to each other. Um, but sometimes you're probably wrong about some pretty critical key details. And so I think that when we think about these problems that we're trying to solve, you know, these really complicated, uh, complex, interesting problems that deal with the need for transformation of systems at a whole, that we really need these translators, these people that can be understanding. Um, you know, when a person says this is a problem, what do they mean? You know, when a scientist says, okay, this is, you know, I have a challenge with this thing here. Are they saying it can't be done? Are they saying it can only be you know, done sort of? What, what does it really mean in, for, for the person who's going to make a business out of it? And then also understanding what are those underlying assumptions or beliefs that they have? What are the things that they are feeding into their black box or the things that are sort of the, the machinery of the black box? That means that you know, they take the same inputs in there and they have a very different thought process because of the underlying assumptions or beliefs that they have. And so what a very good translator can do is actually start to understand what people are not saying, what they're leaving out, you know, what, where they're making an assumption that you know, this solution won't work because um, you know, I've, I've, assu I've assumed these five other things are to be the case. I'm not saying them because you know, to me it's so obvious that they're true, but that's part of why I'm saying that this thing won't work. So again, I'll, I'll bring it back to an example um, that, uh, that I think shows how a translator can help to come up with a solution. Um, it it's, uh, goes back to this question of integrating variable renewable energy. So again, saying, okay, well, how are we gonna deal with this issue that you know, energy 
from the sun or the wind comes when those uh, resources are there and maybe maybe less when we want them. I should say that's a, you know, the, the kind of scientist in me wants to point out that this is a challenge that happens when you get to a certain level of renewable energy penetration. In a place like Alberta, it's somewhere over 50%. So, so first of all, you know, we're probably far actually from this problem in a, in a concrete way, but it, it does exist. And so one of, I think, the most elegant solutions um, that people are, are exploring is storing energy um, in hot water and in ice. And so this is, um, you know, works on a very well understood basic physical principle um, that when you, you know, it takes energy to heat something up and it takes energy to cool it down. Um, and it turns out that a material as simple as water is actually a really good energy storage device like this. It takes a fair amount of energy to heat up water and it takes a fair amount of energy to cool it down. And if you're going to freeze it and turn it into ice, that takes even more energy. And so this is for a, you know, a physicist or an engineer, like sort of the most basic, you know, thing. Like you would barely even spend time thinking about it beyond, you know, the thermodynamics class you took the first year of undergrad because like, duh, everybody knows this. This is totally uninteresting. And so it's not even maybe clear to someone who, who learned this so long ago in their, in their career that you know, there's others out there who don't know this, right? The idea as a scientist that you know, someone doesn't know that the latent heat of water is high and then it takes a lot of energy to cool it down and turn it into ice um, might not even cross their minds, right? I, I think it probably didn't cross my mind before. Um, and so the, the reason that it's exciting from an energy storage perspective is when people talk about storage, a lot of people think immediately of batteries. And you know, batteries are great, and, and there are engineers that are working on making them better. Um, but they do take more expensive materials, and so they are you know, fundamentally more challenging and more expensive. Whereas we're, we're pretty good at you know, a machine to cool down water, right? That's a, a freezer. We all have them, uh, and, and they work really well, and they're not particularly expensive for what they do. And so the solution that uh, one of the ways that you can store energy is actually simply by basically making, taking a big refrigerator. And so there's various companies that have started to develop this. Um, and they have a, a big freezer. And they, uh, this big freezer can make a lot of ice when there's a, a lot of um, you know, extra electricity that's, that's coming from the wind or the sun that's, that's not being used. And uh, you can store this ice you know, in basically like a big um, cooler, um, and, and it's not too hard to insulate it, so it can be stored, you know, for at least for a day, relatively efficiently, and if you want to store these things for longer, you have to work a bit harder. Um, and then in its most basic form, this energy storage is actually just used as a replacement for an air conditioner. And so you, you make your ice, and you take your ice, and you blow a fan across it, and you have an air conditioner, right? It's like so simple that it's almost, you know, Everybody assumes that if that was possible, you would have thought about it already, because like, how easy is that? But then when you go to make a, a business out of it, it gets a bit more complicated, right? So how are you going to um, actually go about getting to all these people that are, you know, would otherwise be installing air conditioners in their buildings? You know, what does that look like? Well, they're probably going to an HVAC contractor. Those HVAC contractors have their um, approaches to HVAC that they learned when they were students, and you know, that's what they know, and they're not necessarily um, you know, looking for something new, because why would they? This is how, the way that things are done. They have the companies that they're buying from, right? And those companies may not be interested in producing this new thing. You know, it might be a, a different uh, company that's doing that. How do, we, um, how do we have the markets for the policymaker? How do we have the markets that actually enable this, right? Is there a price signal that tells the building, um, hey, right now there's a lot of extra electricity, so it would be get great if you could use some of it now, and you know, later on when, when it's gonna be a little bit you know, tighter, there's not gonna be as much extra left over, then that would be a good th time to you know, use your ice air conditioner instead of your other kind of air conditioner. And so this is, I think a perfect example of a solution that takes, um, takes something from all three of these areas to actually make it happen, right? So you need to have that understanding of the science. You need to have the understanding of how do you build a business out of it. You need to have the policy. And it's not necessarily that you need you know, subsidies or, or some kind of special support. You just need to have the rules be set up in a way that allow for someone to come up with this idea and say, hey, I want to make this happen. Um, I, I just, you know, 
you thought of the rules before I had this idea, so how do I fit that in there? And so you need somebody who, or, or somebodies, who can help these three groups of people to kind of talk to each other and understand that the problem is not necessarily a technical one, maybe the first, the first problem. It's how do we, you know, have a market that allows for this? And then how do we start to think about, you know, getting the attention of, of potential customers? And so these are the kinds of things that I think translators and uh, you know, a translator as, as someone who can understand what these different groups are thinking can, can start to do. And so translators can also, I think, find answers more directly. Right? So as a translator, you can sometimes um, seem really smart to people by basically proposing a solution that's really well known and standard in one field to another field. And then everyone goes like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that's the most brilliant idea I've ever heard. Uh, you know, and the translator is sitting there thinking like that's the most basic thing that like those guys, you know, the first year students would all know. Um, that's not to say that it's easy, right? So, so the hard part about finding solutions like these is being able to see the key issue or the problem um, in one field in terms of one that's already been solved. So it's not about being you know, smart and coming up with some totally innovative new solution, but it's just about being able to sort of recognize and say, hey, I know this, this kind of problem is something that's really common um, in this field over there, and this problem that you have, it, looks, it actually looks a lot like that, right? If you sort of strip away um, some of the extraneous details. And again, this is something that, um, you know, just like a translator has to learn how to, to be able to, to translate, how to, you know, learn from, what something means in one language when they know another one very well, this is a skill that, that I think can be learned if, if, um, if people are, are making an effort to learn it. So I have an example of a, what I'm calling a translator solution as well. Um, and that's uh, the growth of, of residential solar um, in the United States. And so it started out quite slow. So you have this, you know, that in case, in case you're not sure what it is, basically when people are putting uh, solar panels on their roofs, and we're starting to see some of that growth here in Alberta. In the U.S., um, you know, it, it started off very slowly, um, and it and it grew relatively quickly. And what was interesting is that for a lot of the time when the growth was still relatively slow, you know, in the sort of first years on this graph, the technology was actually available. Um, and at the time, because of, of some direct support as well that was um, being offered in the U.S., it was actually relatively economic. Right? So the, you know, the business case, if you're a homeowner um, and you're going to buy a, a solar panel or, or you know, borrow some money to buy a solar panel, it actually made sense right? if you sat down and you, and you did the math. And yet people were really hesitant. Right? They were sort of, you know, they didn't quite know, like, is this too good to be true? Like, I don't know anyone else who's done this. How do I know that you know, it's really going to deliver what it says it is? Um, and so the solution, the translator solution that came in, was actually an offering of solar where the homeowners didn't own the solar panels at all. They had a third party, another company that came in um, and basically rented the roof space on the home and put up solar and then paid the homeowner uh, for the roof space rental. And this works great because all of a sudden you could go to the homeowner, the, the salespeople for these companies, and say, look, I have a deal for you. You rent me the space on your roof. You're going to get this monthly payment that's uh, you know, a lease payment for the roof space. And all of a sudden, you know, the risk for the homeowner is, is basically relatively little, right? I mean, there's not that much else that I might want to be doing with my roof. So if somebody wants to you know, rent the space on my roof, I, I'm probably OK with that. Um, and. Uh, the funny thing is that as solar, uh, rooftop solar grew and became more popular, this business model actually has been more or less phased out. So it's very common for people to get loans for, for solar on their roof now because um, you, know, you may not have the, the money to buy a system up front. Um, but people saw that, hey, actually this was a really good deal and by having this middleman that was owning the system, you're kind of giving them an unnecessary cut of the business. So this was, a, was an important model to get things going, but actually over time it sort of almost was so successful it worked itself out of business. And this was a solution, this, um, you know, people sometimes called it like solar as a service. This was a, a financing solution, essentially, right? This wasn't about, you know, making the technology better or being able to explain to the homeowner better why this technology was so great. What it was was creating a financial offering, a business product that was attractive to the homeowner. 
And that was not a solution from the, from the technology at all. And this, this type of solution, this kind of what, whatever product it is sold more as a service, is actually something that, you know, given the great success that solar had with it, that you see people starting to try to do with other clean technologies as well, because it addresses two of the kind of biggest concerns or biggest barriers um, in that transformation we were talking about earlier, which is on the one hand, um, a lot of these, what I would call clean tech solutions, they tend to have higher upfront costs and lower operating costs. So you're asking kind of people to put down a lot of money up front. Um, and then you have this information gap. So you may have a point where you know, the technology itself is very well developed, um, and there are plenty of experts out there who understand you know, that it works perfectly fine, but the broader marketplace hasn't really you know, come to that conclusion yet. Right? It takes time for that information to flow. And so sometimes these, these solutions that look more like you know, what's the business offering or what's the financial offering that I can, that I can bring in um, can be very successful at, at addressing what one might think is just simply a technological problem, like uh, we need to make better solar panels and then people will put them on their roofs. So what do you do with this, right? How do you, how do you become a translator? Um, I think it's, you know, there, there's probably a lot of different paths that one can take to do this. So, you know, I, I kind of know the one that I went on and then that, that's what I can share. Um, so I wanna leave you with these three thoughts about how you become a translator. Three thoughts because I learned in management consulting, you're always supposed to give people things in groups of threes. Um, so the first one I call the, the kind of eat your vegetable advice, right? So you have to, if you're going to sort of understand all these different points of view, you have to experience the different environments somehow. Um, and even the ones you think you won't like, and even the ones you may not like when you're in them. Uh, so, you know, I certainly would not say I was super excited about physics at the end of my PhD. Um, and there were things that I was doing when I started being a consultant. You know, I was working, uh, I, I had a project where I worked for a telecom company um, that was looking at growing their B2B market. I worked for a heavy truck auto parts distribution company. Um, looking at how to optimize their, their sales. Um, and you know, there were times where I kind of thought, this is crazy, like this is not at all what I want to be doing. This is not linked to energy or decarbonization or any of the problems that I want to be solving. You know, why, why am I doing this? Um, but with the benefit of hindsight, you know, I think you can look back and see that you can only, you know, bring those translator skills, bring those sort of solutions from another um, another environment if you've actually been in that environment. Um, and you have to do it for a while, right? And so that's the, that's the second one, the idea of going beyond a generalist level. So, you know, on the one, sense, one hand, it's kind of a caveat that it, it takes time, right? So I don't think that this is something that you can seek to do in, you know, in two years, right? By, by its very definition, you know, that the best translators in the world are also not, you know, learning a language in one year and then immediately um, you know, making really meaningful translations of great works. So there's an element of, of patience to that. Um, but I think there's also on the flip side an, an element of perseverance um, as well, right? And, and realizing that I think people, um, you know, there's, there's certainly a shift, I think, within um, the academic system and I think even with companies and, and sort of more broadly, this realization that, that interdisciplinarity is important, right? And I think the college itself is, is an example of that. Um, but that said, it's still, you know, their old habits die hard, right? Both in, in transitioning a, an energy system, but also in transitioning a system of the way we learn and think. Um, and so I think you, you'll often meet resistance or people that you know, as I was discussing with my, my husband about this concept of this interdisciplinary, uh, he, he's a physicist, and he said, well, you know, for me, that's kind of like when I talk to the chemists, <laughs> right? So <laughs> there's, depends on how far, you know, you go. And so, you know, you may find people who kind of say, okay, well, you want to do interdisciplinary things, that's great, be a physicist and, and talk to the chemists. Um, it has actually gotten better, right? So. Um, I, I learned recently, last year, a story about my grandfather, who was actually um, a chemist, um, 
and he uh, he worked at uh, Brookhaven National Lab. He did experiments um, on on the high flux reactor there, and he actually ran into some problems because he was doing experiments that were sort of a crossover between chemistry and physics. And the funding agency that he had at the time um, kind of learned about this and, and said, no, no, you can't do this. You know, this is money for chemistry. You can't do anything with a physicist with this money. So, you know, I guess in the one generation or couple generations, we moved from the idea of, you know, physics and, and, uh, and chemistry together as being way too out there to that being sort of an accepted interdisciplinary space. Uh, but I think we have a lot further to go to, to moving out of you know, science and, and taking all of these different parts. And so what can you do in the meantime, right, while you're, you're sort of waiting to, to get to beyond this generalist level, is I think that we can, you know, everybody can be a translator in that we can all think about how others are thinking and making decisions, right? So trying, um, you know, little kids do it with their, you know, why, 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 why are, why are you saying this? Why are you saying that? Um, but it's trying to ask that why and in a particular way, right? So trying to understand what are the underlying motivations or experiences or assumptions that this person that's sitting across the table from me might have, right? And, and trying to almost practice that, you know, to, to look at a problem and say, well, if I was coming at this from the perspective of the scientist, you know, what are the things that I would be looking to solve for or what are the assumptions that I would be making? And then similarly, um, you know, from, from the different elements as well, too. And so I think that if one, um, you know, if, if we all started to be a little bit more like translators, if we all started to ask a little bit more about, you know, why um, and, and what are the underlying assumptions, even that we are making ourselves, right, our, our own thought processes are the simplest ones to understand, trying to understand what are the things inside that black box, what are the things that are shaping the processes of those black boxes, then our own critical thinking will, will improve greatly. So thank you very much. Thank you. Sarah, is this on? Yes, okay, great. Uh, my name is Rhonda Breikreitz. I am uh, one of the instructors here at the Leadership College, and I have the honor of um, doing the moderating today for our Q&A. And um, we also have uh, Rob Jackson, one of our teaching fellows, and Benjamin Denga just over there, and they are going to be throwing around the mic, which sounds scary, but it's not as scary as it sounds. So that is the mic, the catch box there and uh, they will be uh, taking it to you, maybe gently throwing it to you, depending on. We'll try not to hit anyone in the face. It has happened in the past, but we're going for a clean year this year. So, Sarah, you raised some really, really interesting uh, points about critical thinking, and one of the things that really stuck with me is this importance of getting different people with diverse perspectives in the room. And so, um, as a starting point, I just wanted to ask, how do you think that we can um, encourage more common ground. What are some simple steps? If you can get people from, with very divergent views and perspectives in the room, how can we start that conversation to get common ground? Do you have any insights around this issue of energy? Because it seems that you know, people are in their, their different uh, corners around this issue. Mm -hmm. How can we bring people together? And do you have any insights into that? It's, it's definitely a challenging one, and I think you, you, know, you said it well. First of all, you just have to get people to agree to be in the same room. Um, and then I think you have to get them to agree to you know, have a real conversation and not just have a kind of talking heads at each other, right? Where you're not, you know, you're not listening, you're just thinking about what the next thing that you're going to say is. Um, and then I think beyond that, you have to get them to actually start thinking about how the other person is thinking. Um, so you know, one, of, one of the neatest things that I've seen to do that is actually to try to force people to, you know, take on the role of the others in that conversation, right? And that starts to get you, whether it's through, um, you know, there's some interesting games that do that, this like energy transition game um, is, is one version where, you know, you have someone, uh, an environmentalist plays the, you know, coal CEO and, and vice versa. And as you start to have to actually try to solve problems as the other person, that starts to give you some insight um, and experience of sort of how they are approaching these problems and it starts to surface what are maybe some of the key sticking points that you didn't realize if you just sort of see it from the outside. 
putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Yeah. Yes. I, I really like the different hats, trying to wear the different hats and think about um, wearing those different hats, being in someone else's shoes, and how that can help to change your perspective mm -hmm. or see it differently. And come up with creative solutions, like the, the solar panels on the roofs. That's really, really amazing. Okay, so let's open it up for uh, Q&A. Are there some questions, some burning questions that we have? I can't really see very well because there's this light that's kind of uh, daunting. So um, if they're okay, great. Do you want me to throw it to you? Yeah. Okay. Hello. <laughs> cool. Hello. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the presentation. I was wondering about this role of the translator. Is it more when you're working in an environment that's linked to policy, or can it also be within the same science field? Hmm. That's a great question. So yeah, I mean, I think, I think within a field or even within a company, you can, you can definitely have a need for translators. Right? We were just actually discussing before, um, before we started this concept that you know, even within a single a single organization that is, you know, has one single goal, you have people that are coming from their own, you know, different backgrounds, and they may have different incentives, right? They have different jobs, they have different things that they're supposed to be optimizing around, and so, you know, we can we can talk about the challenge of between all these different worlds, but often even inside, a, a, even so much as an individual lab, right? If you start to get down to, you know, people may speak a little bit more of the same language and they may have an easier time understanding each other, but they may have um, different, different goals that they're trying to achieve, right? Someone is trying to, you know, graduate soon and somebody else is trying to, um, you know, figure out how to get how to get a publication or, or you know, and trying to be able to have a, a deeper understanding of what are the kind of incentives or, or thoughts that are motivating those actions, um, I think is, is also important as well. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Down here. Hi, thank you for the presentation there. My name is Carlos. I'm one of the PLLC scholars amongst the audience tonight. The question I have, and it's more to, in two stages here, with the idea of frameworks and the contextual frameworks, even in your career going from science and engineering to business to policy, did you find that there was inherent biases that you might have brought at each step of, the, of your career in that area? And with the role of the translator, if these inherent biases exist through these contextual frameworks, should, to what extent is neutrality something that's important within the, the role of the translator? Mm -hmm. That's a really, a really interesting question because I do think that, um, I mean, one way to sort of be a translator is to be completely neutral, right? And, and kind of just come in and say, well, I understand all these people and so you know, then I can, I can get them all to talk. I think another way to be a translator is to, you know, be someone who deeply understands one and then kind of maybe understands a bit the other two and you can sort of almost, you know, you could imagine like the scientist coming with their scientist translator who, you know, sort of says, I, I can understand the scientist and translate for that to, you know, normal people speak um, and, and maybe comes with those biases. So I think that, I think that all of those can, can work in a sense. I think the more that you can, um, you know, be aware of your own biases and understand those. Um, and, and sometimes I think in that process, it's very, um, it's very conscientiously, right? So I, ha I, you know, I can certainly think of times in that experience, particularly in moving from science to business where it was either something that, you know, somebody sat down and directly told me, you know, you, you, people want to understand the answer and then why in that way. Um, and there were other times where you know, it's, it's more of a sort of organic process that happens because you start to live in that other world and, and you start to yourself develop some of those pattern recognition. So I guess the answer is kind of a bit of, a bit of both in a sense, um, as, as long as one's sort of aware of the, the biases that you might be bringing, I think that that can still be a very effective way to, to translate. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Uh, Benjamin, down here, this is somebody. 
Excellent presentation. Thank you. My name is Eva, and I have a question. I want to lever your topic of critical thinking into the other future skills that I know the scholars in the room will be very interested, especially when it comes to leadership. Uh, one of the other key skills will be creative thinking. So when you bring the topic of translators, can you relate that role in every one of those six um, critical skills of the future of work that will apply to the next gen, many of who will be running the world from this room? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a tall order. I mean, one of the things that jumps to mind first, I think, in the creative thinking is that concept of finding a solution from another field to apply to, to the one that, um, that you're in. Right? I think that's actually an interesting form of creative thinking. Right? You don't have to always, it doesn't mean you know, reinventing the wheel and, and coming up with this whole brand new solution, figuring out the ways in which something that works over here could actually work in the, in the topic that you're focused on, I think is a really important version of, of creative thinking. Um, and the creative part is obviously not the you know, core solution because that exists and you're just kind of porting that over. The creative part is the, is the being able to see that the problem is the same and then being able to see how the solution you know, needs to be adapted because it's not gonna be necessarily a perfect fit one-to-one. -one, right? You may have to tweak things at the edges, but, but to figure out how that can be done, to me that's the creative element that, that comes in. I just wanted to allude to the, um, the scenario you mentioned about your father. He was creative in trying to be a chemist and also go going into physics. So he was going outside of the boundaries of the traditional norm. So I'd like to encourage the room to do the same. Thank you. There was another question over here, Sheldon. Is um, hi, I'm Sheldon. I'm also a student in the PLLC. Um, my question was more related to your background information, but uh, I wanted to know how was the causality between the um, carbon in the atmosphere and the increasing temperature demonstrated beyond like the level of correlation? How was like a causal kind of relationship determined there? So that's a that's a good question. I mean, that's really a question for a climate scientist. Um, so I don't know that I can do the answer full justice, right? As a as a scientist from another field, what I would say is that. I, I understand the methods by which you know, the scientific process happens. And so when that correlation is, is determined um, and scientists in that field you know, come out with that answer, then that is uh, you know, one of the ways in which that's determined. Um, I mean, there's some basic physics to the idea of you know, the, the, that an increased concentration in the atmosphere of CO2 um, traps increasing heat, right? And that sort of has to do with the sun's rays coming in at a certain wavelength and being absorbed and then re-emitted at a different wavelength um, and those gases trapping different amounts. So, I mean, there's the, there's the kind of piece of that. I guess I want to say there's sort of two ways to answer your question. And I actually think that's important for the, for the critical thinking element, which is, you know, sometimes if you have that background, you can understand exactly how that is, right? So when could give a physics lecture that kind of explains that, that part. Um, but then there's also the, you know, we're certainly not going to be able to be experts in all of the fields, right? There's just way too much information out there to learn now. And so one of the, I think, important skills to learn is actually to, to be able to understand, you know, how do you determine that, that something is, you know, trustworthy? Uh, and so, yeah, I guess those would be the two answers. Thank you. Another question over on this side. Good catch. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so simple question, short question. How do you drive critical thinking in others? Because you need to bring these groups with you. Uh. Yeah, so it's a short question. Is it a short answer? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think one thing around bringing groups along is to really show people that you're understanding where they're coming from, both in a kind of like compassionate way, but actually also the more that, that people, I think, see that you understand the point that they're making, the deeper that they'll go into that point, right? And so often, I think we, when we have a point to make to someone, you know, we can kind of make it at like the basic level and we may end up stopping there because they may not just not quite get it. And so if you're able to kind of understand what somebody is really meaning and then therefore also able to, you know, start to ask deeper questions around why that is, 
Um, I think that's one way to draw critical thinking out of, out of people. So much of it sounds like uh, good listening skills, like yeah. actually listening rather than coming up with the next point. Yeah. Um, okay. Was there someone else? Oh, okay. It was me. <laughs> Sorry, I can't see very well. That's okay. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Idara. I'm also one of the scholars of PLLC here. Um, my question kind of goes back to the, what you mentioned about the need for translators. And uh, you mentioned that it's about understanding what people are not saying and, and what they're leaving out. So I kind of wanted to get like, more of an idea how you would do that. Would that be by picking up like, nonverbal communication? Or how would you go about understanding what people are leaving out? Mm -hmm. So, well, one of the simplest ways, I guess, is just to ask them, right? So to kind of keep, keep probing. Uh, in sort of a very, again, I guess, open way, but almost like try to make sure that you're not making any assumptions yourself about why someone's saying something. And so you keep asking until you get the full picture. I think when you, when you know a field or a sort of pattern of thinking deeply, there's a bit of a shortcut to that in that you, know, you, you might know what they're assuming because you can put yourself in their shoes and know that you would be assuming the same thing. Um, it's probably still better to check rather than, you know, just to, to um, think you know it. But, um, but I think that, that sort of that was what I was thinking of when I wrote down that slide was that concept that, you know, if you're, if you're coming from the same perspective, you probably know some of the things that are, go that, that are going into that assumption unsaid. Hello. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. I really like the black box notion you um, presented to us. My name is Johnny. I'm also a scholar from PLLC. I'm from uh, Forum 1A or Team Heart. Um, so I want to ask you, what are your tips for us as future leaders? Like, what could you leave with us? It's a bit, it's a tall order. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that, um, I mean, obviously, the, the, the kind of theme or that question of like trying to figure out how to become a translator, right? And so to me, a couple of the more interesting parts of that maybe are the like that need to, to have those different experiences and try those things where, you know, you think maybe I don't even want to be working in this field at all, but there may be something interesting that I can learn from it that, that actually is really critical to what I'm doing in the future. Um, and then I think the other one is to really, to be a bit stubborn about the, the need for this interdisciplinary thinking, that you know, know that you're going out into a world that still exists very much in these silos. And while people may sort of talk about the need to break them down and, and sort of say, yeah, we want to break them down, we're, we're trying to do that, you may find that when you try to get into that space the practicalities of it can get very challenging, right? So even down to the like, you know, if you're in a in a university between two departments, you know, ultimately you're in, in a company between two functions, how are you evaluated at the end of the day? You know, are you are you expected to have two masters and, and do, you know, everything for the one team and everything for the other team? And so I think that there will be always these challenges and barriers that come up in that form. Um, but to not let them, you know, stop you, to be prepared for them, but also be thinking about ways around them. Thank you. Okay, we have room, time for two more questions. There's... Yeah. Hi. yeah. Hi, I'm Isha. I'm a scholar here as well. Uh, my question is related more to collaboration. So one of your slides mentioned the intersection between technology, business, and government. So what do you think is the key challenge preventing these three sectors to collaborate and solve the climate problem, and how that challenge can be solved? Hmm. <laughs> just, just a small question to end. The, I, was, I was thinking, actually, as I was working on the slides for this talk, too, that I had like maybe put forward too ambitious of a title. You know, that people were going to come expecting that I had the answers to all of this. So um, we're planting seeds. Uh, here. Yeah. So, so with the caveat that I don't, don't have all the answers, I think two, there's two things that stand out to me. So one is just creating the spaces for those groups to come together. Right. So again, I think the systems that we have in place, um, you know, whether it's like the kinds of conferences that people put on or the, the different events that get people to collaborate and be working together, they're often drawing very much from one of those silos. Um, so trying to find ways to, um, to kind of change the structure of the interaction that we have. Um, 
Um, and then the other is that is that piece about learning more about um, you know what those different worlds are. What are the concerns, or what are the things that a policymaker is trying to optimize for? How can I help to make their you know how can I explain my issue or my challenges or what I need within a framework that they're going to understand? Okay, was there, okay, so we have a question over here and then we have one up here and then unfortunately we need to shut it. So there's just one over there and then one down here. Hi there. Um, I was wondering in the context of transitioning to a lower, lower carbon economy, are there any specific values um, slash motivations or narratives that uh, you found that stakeholders agree upon? So there's there's a lot of work that's been done on that. Actually, some of my colleagues have just finished some work called the Alberta Narratives Project. So I would encourage you to, to take a look at that if you haven't already. Um, that that kind of they did a very broad uh, piece of work with a lot of different stakeholders around Alberta to, to actually get at that question of you know what are the kind of things that we have in common as Albertans um, and that that. Uh, you know, some of the things that came out of that were that concept of, um, you know, working together to solve a problem, right? And and really, obviously, removing this whole conversation from a from one of blame and faults, and being able to you know understand that um, we're all trying to achieve the same things for our families and for our communities. Um, and, and coming from that place of shared you know future vision of of kind of a positive positive solution, positive, you know, prosperous economy for, for everybody. And I do think that's important, right? Coming back to that question of, you know, if you put everybody in a room and if people feel like, you know, I'm blaming you and you're blaming me, then, you know, that just shuts down the conversation right there. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. And then one more question down here. Hey. Um, I'm Jason, and I am also a PLLC scholar from the 1F Forum. Um, the thing that resonated with me about this whole thing was the interdisciplinary aspect of all these different groups coming together, because I think like with such a complex issue, if you want to move forward with it, you really need to have people like trying to work together. And without that, you're just going to have a bunch of squabbling groups and you're not going to really make any progress, right? Um, so in that regard, I think getting them all to kind of work together in like a problem-based approach is very essential for the first step. Um, Going a bit beyond that, once you kind of get people to work together, um, for Alberta in specific, what do you think or what would you hope would be like um, a solution or um, something you'd hope to see um, people working towards within the next couple of years in terms of like a more short term goal? Mm -hmm. So I think on the short term, there's a lot that you know, we can be doing to make our own economy and our own kind of built environment and transportation system and all these things more efficient. Um, that both, you know, has a climate element to it, an emissions aspect to it, but actually um, also has a, you know, cost element and a, and a convenience element, right? And so I think that, um, I, I heard somebody say once that uh, clean tech solutions have to be a pain pill, not a vitamin, right? And so the idea is not to kind of, you know, force people to do this thing because it's good for them and like, you know, you should do it. But what are the other challenges that we might be facing that we can solve and also address um, some of the, the climate or emission challenges as well? And so I think it would be great if we were looking at, you know, some of the underlying challenges that we face as a society and thinking about those intersecting solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, all for your great, great questions. Um, I think that you gave us a lot to think about, Sarah. Thank you so much for a Thank wonderful you. presentation <laughs> to all of you. So our next talk will be on October 29th. Um, please uh, come out again and participate in that. And now the scholars will all go to their respective forums, et cetera. Thank you very much. <laughs>